start. Uh, now we have presentation of June de Grot. She is representative of uh, Defense for Children International Netherlands. She gained her PhD on juvenile penal law with her dissertation, Just Rehabilitation, and worked several years as a psychologist in child welfare agencies, did psychological research for the family court, and worked as a coordinator in the child psychiatry. So a lot of experience, uh, interesting and uh, uh, multidisciplinary approach. So uh, June, the floor is yours. Hi, well, thank you so much for your introduction. And I'm happy to be a part of today's workshop, of course. <clears throat> I have sometimes I'm a bit, my voice is not always very loud, but I try to do it in a good way. Um, let me start to share my screen. Yes. Okay. Well, as you heard, I've worked a lot of years, uh, as you can understand at my age, I've worked a lot of years in the uh, child justice system. Sorry, uh, June, if I could only intervene. Ah, uh, of course. We enter the full mode. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sorry. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> well, um, today at this the first, uh, at the second this afternoon, I will uh, talk more about the, um, the, the situation in the Netherlands with the individual assessment. Uh, but now I start um more with the uh, so there is some overlap with stephanie who you heard this morning um because i'm trying to tell of course about the basic principles on childhood and child development but um i also will talk about the crc the convention on the right of the child in that respect and as you can imagine there will be some overlap then <clears throat> um if you look at a convention on the right of the child, then you see that all the protection of rights for children is, uh, of course, as first is all forms of physical or mental violence, injury or abuse, neglect or neglecting treatment, maltreatment or exploitation, including, of course, sexual abuse. That is Article 19. Well, if you look at more bright, broad way on that article, then um, it's also um, has to do with the access to justice. And that's, of course, for today's subject, the most important of it. <clears throat> Interventions and actions taken should always um, respect and promote the rights of children. Um, that's not only a legal and uh, only not a moral imperative, but really a legal obligation, of course. Well, you have like Article 3 said, the best interests. We will talk to that, I think, the whole day. The best interest of the child, of course. Um, meaningful participation. I always um, am, um, I, I think that uh, participation for juveniles is one of the most important things. Um, if you involve them in all your uh, questions and, in, and especially also in what you want with your child, furthermore in the process, it's very, very important to have participation. But participation is of course only also possible if you give them information. And that sometimes is not all, not the case uh, in the juvenile uh, panel law. Survival of development, as Stephanie talked about that this morning, and of course, non-discrimination. <clears throat> For our subject, these articles uh, are the most important if you derive them from the best interests, <clears throat> talking about, of course, juvenile delinquents. Article, article 37, it says separation from adult, adults in detention. And if you, <clears throat> in the Netherlands, we are also looking not only because we have already, of course, separated uh, adults and juveniles, but if you look at it in the way of um, when you first come to the police, the police cells are not really child friendly. 
and not always or most of the time even not separated from the adults. So that is something we are still working on. Um, and then you have, of course, Article 40, the procedural guarantees. Well, that's including, of course, legal assistance, but also presence of parents at court hearings um, when you're talking about the juveniles. Uh, and sometimes, you know, parents don't even know that, but they are all, uh, of course, um, get a letter with the um, for to come, but that's not always um, that they understand that that's their legal right. <clears throat> well, what is a child? What's a child? It says it's very simple. <laughs> it is a child as every human being below the age of 18 years, unless under the law applicable the child maturity is attained earlier. For in the Netherlands, our juvenile penal law is uh, applicable under the, for the youth uh, between 12 and 18. The definition provides a point of common reference to bring together a universal set of standards concerning children. It's important to note that all children are the subject of rights that are universal and whose application is a legal obligation and not, like I said before, a moral imperative. Well, as everybody knows, children are fundamentally different than grown-ups. Um, in physically and psychological development, and therefore they are in need of special attention and special protection. Often childhood is uh, understood by reference to particular cultural and social context. Every culture and social context is of course different, but in a way children grow up in, um, in uh, similar ways in uh, different cultures. But still, it's very important to be aware that our perspective will determine the expectation we place on children. Children will respond to any expectations that we have for them. And that's always, it's like balancing between those expectations we both have. <clears throat> um, the physical, cognitive, emotional, and social, moral, um, they are all, of course, interlinked to each other, with each other. It's uh, the process of growth and maturation of the human individual, individual from conception to adulthood. And well, today we talk more about the childhood to ad adulthood. Well, as you know, of course, physical refers to the child's body. Uh, cognitive refers to what a person or child knows and understands. Emotional refers to feelings rather than to the knowledge. Um, social morals, no, that speaks also for itself. Social development is about knowing how to communicate and act with others. And if you grow up, then it's very, very important, as we see also later, that a safe environment will make grow up much easier in and um, you have a better purpose um, pr to grow up. If you look at the developmental psychology, <clears throat> we um, I will call two names, Jean Piaget. They're two the older um, psychologists and Eric Erickson, but funny enough, they are older, but we are still many psychological uh, theorists are also based on uh, again, these two um, who are mentioned so many times. Um, in this, um, for this workshop, we are more focused, of course, on the um, adolescence bec <clears throat> because juvenile delinquency, um, like in the Netherlands, starts at 12, the, the juvenile penal law, I mean. So you understand that it's more the adolescence where we are. Then Piaget called that stage the formal operational stage. And Eric Erickson, he speaks about adolescence, like um, that it's always a fight between two things. And he says identity versus confusion. But what I like to see, let you show you, is not only their theories, but also because it is um, nowadays, it's more that we talk about brain development because we know so much more than we used to know about it. 
we know now that the synapses are growing when you, you look at this at the newborn and then you see so many, many, many more uh, synapses when, the, uh, when you are adult. Because it's like your brain is perhaps like the growth is already uh, like an, uh, an grown up, but not what is happening in, of course, in the brain development. And um, when you look at the adolescents, you see that they're um, uh, taking responsibility, um, trying to um, behave yourself, um, and all those things are much more easier when you are adults than like you are in the adolescents. So because the juvenile delinquents, they are, um, if you were look back again to the brains, they are still having uh, to um, the, the moral sense uh, looking at the world, but also like uh, behavior, um, not to be too impulsive. All those things are still growing, growing in your brain. Um, so it's a difficult phase, as they say it. And it's not always like Bandura used to say, a storm und drang phase, but still it is a phase wherein um, a lot of our uh, youngsters are searching for their identity and do that sometimes in a very, very struggle way. Um, and that's, I mean, of course, social emotional also. Um, as I said, the brain continues to mature and change. Um, coordinated complex decision making, impulse control is still very, very difficult. We all, we, I mean, I think if you look at the youngster to teens in your own country, you always see that uh, they're be blamed that they are not thinking, think before you, your, um, before you do anything. And I think that's in all the countries uh, for youngsters a problem. Um, social and emotion, emotional stability becomes often after 20. They, what they say about brain development, that it's most of the time at 25 that then the brain has finished to grow. Not really, of course, but most of it. And I think that's what they still, it's arbitrary if they say 25. I think there are different opinions in, the, in that respect. The peer group becomes more important than family. And that's, of course, also a dangerous thing because if the peer group, group is um, going to school and doing everything which is um, expected from them, then it's, of course, different. But peer group often will longs to explore um, all the things in life, like um, alcohol and drugs and stuff like that. And then of course, a peer group can be a very different influence. And that's also what you see, of course, in juvenile delinquency, that often they are um, in connection with a peer group, which is not um, always doing the right things. Looking for boundaries, well, that's in the same respect, of course, that you see that they are trying new stuff, trying new things, and uh, that's not always on their, um, for their own happiness. And if you now look at the, um, you grow up in your environment and there um, are protective factors in your family, but the whole surroundings, also your school and everything. But also, of course, there are the, the factors are, uh, we call them risk factors. And if you look at uh, the protective factors, then you can see that in the child itself is uh, resilience. Um, and one, some children are, have much more resilience than others. Um, and you can also think about um, the mental uh, age of a child. I mean, an age can be 12, but, uh, but that's the calendar age. And the, still the developmental age can be uh, much, much younger. So that's also something which is sometimes difficult for, um, for the child itself, but also, of course, for the parents. Support of parents is, of course, very, very important, as, you, as we all know. 
Um, sometimes it's not parents to blame, of course, but is it very difficult for them to support a child, especially if you talk about, uh, let's say, a child with disabilities or a child who has very difficult difficulties with in, in social respect. It's not always easy for parents to have a, uh, um, a good attitude for that. Um, uh, you see, a positive school process is, of course, a protective factor. If a child um, goes to school and uh, have good results, that's, of course, always more easy for him or her to uh, be also in family life um, good acting. It's very um, difficult if you have not enough social support. Social support is very important. Support from your family, of course, but it also can be on a school that there is a teacher or good friends and everything like that that will have a, give you a more uh, also better role models. Um, I, um, I thought um, it's also good for sometimes for youngsters to have like a mentor or something, and even doesn't not your own parents, of course, but perhaps like somebody in your family, in your neighborhood or whatever, can have um, a very supportive role for you and can, can <clears throat> help you in making growing up a bit easier. The role models, what I said, of course, that can be in your peer group, but it's also very, very important that you have role models in your own environment. Um, we, we, in the Netherlands, we have also like uh, extra lessons sometimes for children, especially children for uh, coming from uh, socioeconomic uh, difficult backgrounds, so that they can uh, contact also with uh, much more positive role models, because they often don't see them in their own environment. And it's so much important um, if they can see them well. And as I said before, the positive relation with your peer group is very, very important. Because if you are looking for your identity and you are building your identity, and then it's, of course, most important that you have your positive relations with your own age friends. But then, of course, you have the protective factors and that what I said, you have the risk factors. If you look now at uh, uh, the vulnerability of a child, um, sure, it can be that a child had uh, already um, uh, had a trauma, mentally impairing us, uh, but every child uh, can be vulnerable in a different way. And sometimes, especially in the age of the adolescence, can be uh, a child more vulnerable because of the you now the puberty your whole body is changing the, in the biological sense and that also has often uh, not a positive way of looking at yourself because it's so difficult to cope of course with all those biological changes in your body so that gives them sometimes that they're very insecure um, that it's very difficult to cope with that for youngsters um, a risk factor, of course, is poverty. The socio-economical stage st status of a family makes um, a big, big difference for where you grow up. Um, so children who are grow up in uh, poverty, it's known that it's much more difficult to grow up, of course, and they're, they're really more um, seen, of course, in the juvenile delinquency, as we all know. Instable family life often is called not, uh, one, fam one parent uh, family um, is, of course, can be uh, um, in, in, in difficult for the child. <clears throat> if, we then, if we think about neglect, sexual abuse, uh, child abuse, then we talk about unsafe environment. And as you all know, if you want to grow up in, an, uh, in a safe environment, it's so much easier to uh, become an, an adult without too many problems. So it's very, very important that you always look in what kind of environment is a child growing up. Um, substance use, of course, is a risk factor, as we all know. I don't have to explain that. 
um, we talked about a positive peer group, the positive role models. Unfortunately, what I said before, you have often, especially I think in this uh, uh, stage of development, that you have a negative peer group. And that has, of course, an, a bad influence on the behavior of the youngster. Aggression, it says for itself. And sometimes it's not that you can say that child is always aggressive. Of course not. Sometimes it is the impulse reaction or stuff. Eh? And it doesn't always have to be that there is a real big problem. But even only have you have aggression problems once in a while, that can be a reason to come into the juvenile delinquency sector. Um, I would like to uh, share, an, um, an, uh, in the Netherlands, we talk about the safety house. And I think because what we just said about all the risk factors in family life, um, but I just uh, showed you that these are the risk factors. If you look at those, then you know that it's often um, what you can see is that in multi-problem families. Multi-problem families, well, as we have them in all countries, of course, um, in the Netherlands, we have uh, uh, thought about uh, in, to make a safety house. So in that all the um, uh, social uh, welfare uh, workers, etc., would work together in one house, to uh, several social agencies. Um, it started in 20, 2013, and, um, and all the juvenile panel law and social psychology help are matches together and they work together in, uh, in one house, we call it one house. And uh, to make one family, one plan and one director so that there is one person who makes the plan and who is the one who has the most um, influence, who works most with that family who has all those problems. Um, what you see is that the key partners are working much better together if they are in one house. I mean, the communication is of course easier. And I th really think that it's uh, good that we have um, a safety house like that. Um, in, uh, it's, it's like, in, uh, I don't know anymore, but it's in the, uh, in the video you just will see that there are um, in several regions in the country, you have those safety houses and the municipalities <clears throat> are the ones who are uh, organizing most of it and have the coordinating role uh, in it. Let me sh try to show the... Uh, let me see if I can do it because now I want to show you them, but mm, let me see. Then I have probably to stop this. Sorry. Um, let me do it like this. That's easier. Sorry. Yes. Successful strategy for multi problem families, crime, and serious misconduct requires more than care or punishment alone. It calls for a joint approach by municipalities, care providers, and judicial partners. The Safety House does just that. This integrated community safety service is a group of fixed key partners, the police, public prosecutor, youth care, and municipalities. If necessary, other parties join in these efforts, such as housing corporations or social workers. The added value of a safety house lies in its focus on complex problems. Examples include a combination of a criminal offence, addiction and parenting problems. A safety house does not focus on all target groups. A certain case is only eligible for discussion in the safety house if it satisfies the following criteria. 
Has the family or person been having problems in a few areas? Is criminal behaviour or misconduct involved, or is this a risk in the future? Are parties from more than one chain necessary to deal with the problems? The Safety House also focuses on local security problems, such as when a group of young people are causing problems in a neighbourhood. The collaborating partners draw up one plan that is usually a combination of punishment and assistance. Each key partner may introduce their own case, and as a group, analyse the problem and appoint a coordinator who is responsible for a collective strategy, in which each party is assigned its own role. The coordinator integrates the assistance provided and makes sure the agreements are being met. This results in fast and efficient help. Family and others are considered in the analysis and creation of the plan. The concept, one family, one plan, one director, is applied during this process. Municipalities in the 25 national safety regions have been running the safety houses since the 1st of January 2013. Every municipality can work with the safety house in its region. Municipalities work together to create links between local organisations regarding care and safety issues. In every region, municipalities and partners decide where, how and with whom the safety houses work. It pays off to make administrative agreements in this regard. This ensures that the cooperation within the safety house will be an effective tool for safety policy, providing an even better guarantee for a safe society now and in the future. I'm sorry, I don't know if you still hear me. Yes, we do. Yes, but you don't see me. <laughs> um, green. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, it's not on the full screen. Um, I said also gives you some links to um, document sites um, and uh, perhaps you have some questions about a safe house, safety house, I can imagine. Um, of course, you can ask them, um, uh, but perhaps it's good to look at these, but I also can send you, of course, those links because it's, it's um, very useful if you want to mo know more about CRC and also about all the children's rights. And it gives you an, an, a nice view and, uh, on it. Um, I forgot to tell you that I, uh, like um, Stephanie, was also a part of the focus uh, workshop. And so a part of the uh, slides were also used there on, in the focus. So that would be better if I tell you that. Um, and of course, as you know, I'm an, uh, with Defense for Children. I uh, work there on a project base. Are there some questions about, especially perhaps the safety house or another subject? There is one chat, let me see. Yeah. Or do you want uh, the Q&A after my second? Is that perhaps better, Ruta? Yes, I guess, yes. We put yeah. it, uh, after the second presentation. Because I also had a poll, uh, but I don't know if that's perhaps that's more about um, uh, the, the, the the teenage, the, the adolescents, adolescents. So perhaps that's good otherwise to do that now, the poll. Thomas, is that? I don't know if he's there. He, he's there, yeah. Ah, thank you so much.
it's not very difficult to fill it in, I guess. <laughs> May I ask you something in the meantime? Of course. Hi, June. This is Gabriella from Defense for Children in Italy. Hi. Okay. I wanted to ask you um, regarding the safety house. Uh, is it there that this pool of experts that are doing the individual assessments is their role? Is their responsibility? Uh, yeah, but the individual assessment, as we know it for the juvenile uh, delinquents, that's not done in a safety house. So no. in the safety house, it's more for, uh, there, there comes also, of course, uh, juveniles, but it's not like our individual assessment as we use it, the lay, we call it in the Netherlands, that's not used in the safety house itself, but the safety house can be well a part of it. Mm -hmm. so that's the difference. But in the safety house itself, because the agency are working together, there, um, of course, they um, have also their um, kind of assessment, but not mm -hmm. in the way as we talk about it today. Mm -hmm. Thanks. It reminded me like uh, uh, the bar now is for children victims is like a sort of uh, place right. where you have different services and different. Uh, professional in the same place uh, meeting the child yeah but that's also but that the barn house is much much um, how do you say it um, and, and, and I think I, I, I'm very I'm, I'm a big fan of it because I think that's great but there's also more also the uh, uh, the victim help for the victim and the support, yeah, for that. support so it's much much bigger than we have in the Netherlands mm -hmm. yeah. Thank I you. would love to have it here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Mm. Desire to belong to a group, everybody agrees. Beginning to think more abstractly. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's only a beginning because they still have a long way to go. And that's, of course, because of our brain development, which is, of course, not so far that it's easy to think more abstractly. Um, want to be recognized in unique in the individual. Um, that's part of um, trying to get your identity all together. And that's, of course, very important. But it uh, takes time before you really are, are being recognized as it. Uh, teens are emotional, vulnerable. I think we all know that, but it's still, it's good to think about it because if that's the age group you're working with, then you always have to consider the vulnerability of the youngster itself, but also the, the family because they um, have to live with an, a youngster in difficult times, often sometimes difficult times. Yeah, but good in planning is still very difficult. <laughs> Thank you for. Uh, does somebody wants to say, add something about the poll? No. Good to see, uh, Gabriella, that you have the child participation. I'm, as you can hear this afternoon, I'm very fond yes. of child participation. <laughs> so you will, you will hear more about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was one of the projects that we implemented, like 12 projects. Ah, it great. was on child participation in the uh, criminal uh, justice system. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I will, and it will. I will talk some more about individual assessment and CRC as a start. Um, well, we return again to the uh, Article 3, um, the best interest of the child, of course, and it always shall be our primary consideration. Um, and what they say in the, in the number 40, command number 14, um, it's aimed at ensuring both the full and effective enjoyment of all the rights recognized in the convention and the holistic development of the child. And the holistic development of the child, that's of course very important. Also the individual assessment has to have a holistic view on the child. 
um, the purpose of the individual assessment. These are only, of course, a few I mentioned because there are many, many, many more to mention, of course. Um, to ensure juveniles can access their proced procedural rights, to ensure, <clears throat> sorry, um, let me, yes. <clears throat> to ensure that the specific needs of juveniles and their families, of course, concerning protection, education, training, and social integration are taken into account. Um, to identify specific protection needs and to determine whether and to what extent they will benefit from special measures in the course of criminal proceedings. To engage children in the process, with a view to empowering them to participate better in the proceedings as a whole. We can um, more further on, we will talk more about participation um, and participation is of course, very, very important part of uh, helping uh, the juvenile. The Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, defines the best interest um, in comment number 13 as a threefold concept substantive right, the right of the child to have his or his best interest assessed and taken as a primary consideration. The legal principle, meaning that if a legal profession is open to more than one interpretation, the interpretation which must most effectively serve the child's best interest, that one should be chosen. Then we have the rule of procedure, Whenever a decision is made that will affect a specific child, group of children, or children in general, also important, this decision-making process must include an evaluation of the possible impact, positive or negative, of the decision on the child concerned. So every time there has to be an, an evaluation, um, the child goes to court again, or whatever, there must be an evaluation. Then we return to child participation, as I told Gabriela. Um, <clears throat> ch children have a specific right to participation, as set out in Article 12. Well, states parties shall assure to the child who is capable of forming his or her own views, the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting the child the views of the child being given due weight in accordance with the age and maturity of the child. Um, so children have the right to, to participate and express their views on all matters that affecting them. So also uh, in the individual assessment and the whole procedure of the juvenile panel law that the children have to participate, their own opinions and view have to be asked. <clears throat> um, also adopting a child-centered approach, the purpose is to promote children's participation. Um, a goal to increase fulfillment of children's right to participation and to promote children's active role in society as social actors, citizens and protagonists. So it's a much broader view, of course, on uh, child participation. And it should be considered in each stage of programming and in different thematic areas of work. It means to secure the rights to survival, development, protection and participation. So it all comes together again. The Committee on the Rights of the Child has developed a non-exhaustive and non-hierarchical list of elements that could be considered by any decision maker having to determine, determine a child's best interests. The child views, we just talked about that. The identity of the child, and that's very important, including sex, sexual orientation, national origin, religion and beliefs, cultural identity and personality. It, it should always be to determined by the decision maker. The family environment, a child has a right to their family uh, environment and to uh, family relations and contact. Also, that uh, is very important if you look at the procedures that there must be contact with their families. The care, protection and safety of the child, including the child's well-being and development. 
situations of vulnerability, including the risk that the child is facing and the sources of protection, resiliency and empowerment. Their child's rights and needs with regard to health and education. We have to think about all those elements when we also think, of course, about the individual assessment. And it's all, of course, defined through the best interests. Article three again. There is no general agreement of what a child-centered approach is, but the basic principles involve engaging with children and their families, of course, that speaks for itself, understanding and providing services that reflect our individual needs. So you have to look what are those individual needs because otherwise you can't provide services on them, those needs. Taking into account their wishes and feelings, but remaining aware they may not yet fully understand the risks involved in their choices. That's always very important also to think about because uh, the juvenile gets information and you hopefully the good information about the whole juvenile panels process, but also the parents, but often they do not really understand what is happening and what they choose um, is that in their best interest. So it's very important that that's of course where there is often a lawyer um, on their side to explain those things, but also of course the social worker and all the other agencies should explain the children and their parents much more about all the, um, <clears throat> all the risks they take or uh, what choices they make. Um, the list go further, ascertaining children's wishes and feelings by communicating appropriately in terms of age, language, ethnicity and ability. And that's of course very important because you can look only at the age of the child, <clears throat> but you should look at what is the developmental age because that often is really a difference. If you uh, think of the a child, oh, he is almost 18, he will understand. But then you see that it's perhaps um, in his mentally age is much below that, then you really should consider it. Uh, maximizing their participations in discussions about their welfare. Again, again, and again, this whole afternoon, we will talk about the participation because the, 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 if you listen to the youngster, him or herself, uh, they can also think about their own welfare and uh, have to have, have to be a part of the uh, discussion about our welfare, including them in decision-making. Um, yeah, that's of course, again, it's the, the same thing of participation, but making them a part of the decision-making. So uh, also make that he or she um, will understand the decision better if, you, if it's good being explained. And because he's or is a part of it, it will be easier to um, uh, to be motivated um, in in the further steps to be taken, taking account of their strength and their unique knowledge of their own situation, we, we sometimes forget that the youngster um, has also an opinion and um, uh, about his or her own situation, and also the parents, and it should be really considered. Um, to that they know <clears throat> what would be the best for him or her. Um, <clears throat> making sure that any judgment about what's in a child's best interest and any perceived limitations of risk should be allowed to dominate completely and hinder professionals from taking account of children's agencies. I think that we often forget that that it's uh, very uh, in, in, uh, that the professional have to think about this, facilitating the access to independence advice or advocacy, especially where a social worker or agencies views conflicts with those of a child. Uh, in independent advice is always, of course, important. But what you often see is that, well, not often, but sometimes you see that there is an uh, an conflict. Uh, between, let's say, the social worker and the juvenile delinquent. And it's good to that somebody 
um, uh, has independent advice to help this out because you uh, what you often see is that they um, don't understand why a social worker uh, makes a decision or an agency makes a decision and I think if sometimes if you explain it in more clear words then it's um, better because then one the juvenile understands it and secondly will be more motivated to um, work along with that decision or that advice well key principles if you look of course at the best interests and stuff like that then you see that the key principles for an individual uh, individual assessment is be transparent and informative like I said before, if you don't give the good information, the, the juvenile can't uh, participate in a good way and can't make a good decision. Be inclusive, be voluntary, be respectful, be relevant, be child and youth friendly. Um, that's not only, of course, in the language and everything sometimes, but I will talk later on that. It's also the envir environment and uh, the provisionalism of the worker. Provide enough time and resources, be supported by capacity development. Um, then we go and come to what I just said, information in understandable language, that's being transparent, but understandable language, I mean, of course, we, look, we think then about ethnicity, but again, you also have to think about the age of the child, of the youngster and to think if there is uh, well you know if it's um it's if somebody um like sometimes it is that the child has to explain it to the parents and uh, you have to consider is that the right way to do it or should i have an uh, informal uh, uh, person who can help the child think about things like that because that's very important open approach in safe childly environment. In the Netherlands, we have, uh, for example, but that's for the, tw the 12 minors, we have a an, uh, an, uh, separate an, an child-friendly room. Uh, children can draw there and um, what there is, that there is an audio, audio visual registration um, so that the child or the youngster doesn't have to tell over and over again the same story, the same information, but that's always uh, that used to be the case in the Netherlands, but sometimes it still is, unfortunately. Um, and, and I talk about the 12 minors because um, that's, uh, that's also for the um, victims so that's why we have also those uh, child friendly environment because for the victims we um, we try to talk to them in a more child friendly environment so that the trauma uh, is not uh, worsened by the environment we also have like a separate waiting room in the courts for the juveniles um, and I said before the audio visual registration so that there is not the uh, always telling the same same information. Respect wishes and possibilities and um, again developmental age and not like the, the real age can be different. Language is of course very very important the cognitive level and the ethnicity. Um, uh, mental uh, disabilities are, of course, it's something very, very difficult to uh, see that in the uh, first acquaintance with the youngster. So it sometimes needs more expert um, uh, to look at the child. But if you have um, the idea that it's perhaps uh, that that's the case, there should be looked for a professional who is more trained in it. Um, like we have that with the police, we have um, several persons trained, but it's so uh, not very uh, many people who are. So it's always difficult in that first stage when you uh, see a youngster in juvenile delinquent, then it's very difficult to um, measure that uh, in good time. Um, offer care help that meet individual needs. 
um, and special educated professionals, I said before, but it's sometimes difficult, especially in the first stage of the process when the juvenile uh, comes. Um, it's difficult to have immediately educated professionals, of course. Um, the child-centered approach in the Netherlands, um, I will try to talk about two approaches we have in the Netherlands. Uh, also one, of course, the individual assessment. We have, um, oh, sorry. We have the um, ZSM, we call it, but it is, if you uh, translate it, the ASAP as soon as possible. And that's um, speedy, selective, smart, and supportive for victims. But so it is for the juvenile delinquents, but this means that it's also try to be supportive for the victims. Otherwise you perhaps, I confuse it. Um, in this uh, ZSM, the ACAP, um, are several agencies working together. Um, the, the speedy, it means of course, quickly as possible, possible sorry, um, selective, for less severe offenses, because it's a very quick process. So it's more for the first offender sometimes than it is for, um, uh, for perhaps if you know that they already go for a longer way in the judicial system. Um, alternative to the criminal system, that's also, and smart chain partners work together. Um, let me see, the, um, the police is of course in it. Um, the police is, uh, what we try always to avoid is that the child goes um, uh, to the police cell because as I said before, our police cells in the Netherlands are uh, still not only for, uh, not really separate buildings for the juveniles and for the adults, like we, uh, we would like to have that, but that's not only the case in some, uh, police agents, police agencies, um, and that they are more friendly. There are, um, there's just been a research, and that they made a lot of recommendations how a police cell should look if the youngster go in custody. But um, that's only now still the suggestion. It's not built yet. Um, but what we do, of course, in Lens is try to avoid that they go to custody because we, it's, like, it's more like that we want to um, do that um, as less as possible. Then we have of the police, of course, then we have HALT. That's like HALT is, um, is the alternative. Um, this community service and educational service. Um, it exists already since 1981. And it's professional. It make it. It's it, it's um, it is the goal is to prevent a criminal record because other a criminal record is of course stigmatized, and we try to uh, to avoid that. Um, halt is of the first choice, especially with first offenders, um, and then it's for the twelve till twenty three years even. Um, now, punishment is generally more effective the quicker it is handled out. Immediate and consistent punishment works generally better than postponed punishments. That's why we do this speedy selective um, way of work in this ACAP. Um, well, we talked before and you saw, saw the animation video about the safety house. They are also part of this ACAP. Of course, the district attorney, the public prosecutor's office is, of course, a very important part of it. Um, what they do in this approach, they uh, try to react or they not try, they react um, in six hours um, with uh, what to do further for the child. Then we have the child protection service, the child protection service agency, um, social workers, are uh, getting all the information as quick as possible. And uh, they, of course, the information will be shared with all the others. The youth probation is also, uh, is always be in this um, uh, approach. 
and the probation uh, officer sometimes try even in but in a very fast process it's sometimes difficult to have also some information of the schools um, youth with a few risk factors um, it, and when, when you say, okay, little has to be done in this case of this first offender, because most of the time it then are first offenders, then they say more victim oriented approach. So that also the, the victim is be taken in consideration. And then we talk, of course, about restorative justice. So even in this, this, this fast uh, working scheme, they try to think about it, oh, uh, is it also possible possible to have a perhaps like, well, let's uh, uh, call it a conversation with the victim or something, and then it will be more uh, going to restorative justice. Um, and the child prot uh, protection uh, service um, often uh, talks, no, not often, talks also to the parents, of course, and try is, is also the one who gives the most information to the parents uh, of, of how the procedure is going on. And if the child is uh, going to HALT, then of course it's HALT the one who uh, will talk more uh, with the parents and the juvenile delinquent. What they most often do with HALT is that they do it like, um, I think they have like three, you know, I know, three conversations <clears throat> with the parents and the youngster. And they, um, they um, make an, uh, either a community service or an educational service, uh, what the child has to do. And they try, of course, to have the, the juvenile as much motivated as possible. So also they try to have uh, the participation of the youngsters as much as possible. Then I come to the, in the individual assessment in the Netherlands we uh, already have. Unfortunately, I can't show the video I had planned because it's not longer uh, with an English ex, uh, with an English undertitling. But the lay, uh, the national instrument of the juvenile criminal justice system, in Dutch the acronym is LEI, so that's why we call it LEI. Um, the LEI instrument is used for screening and risk and needs assessment of each minor in the Netherlands who is in conflict with the law. It mainly focuses on measure of recidivism risk. I re that's really the main, so not unfortunately only for helping the child or whatever, but especially for looking at what risk is our, of recidivism. Um, there are several domains, I will tell, uh, talk later about it, uh, on which the lay is um, uh, contributing. Um, what the lay is used for is that it's uh, flagging, screening um, of each uh, and, and, and it's taking a risk and need assessment of each minor in the Netherlands who is in conflict with the law. The lay consists of a coherent package of instruments uh, for risk and needs assessment. Um, uh, the agency who are using it are the police. That's of course the first agency the child is in contact with. What I talked before is HALT, uh, the Child Care and Protection Board, of course, uh, the Juvenile Probation Service, and the judi Judicial Juvenile Institutions. Um, the Protection Board is the one who is the most responsible for the lay in the sense that um, he's taking, she is stay or he or she is taking care of um, that the 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 that all the agencies are working together and get the inf information they are um, they have to get. The lay is evidence based. Um, it is um, evidence based according to the principles of the risk needs rep responsivity model. Um, that is from Andrews and Bonta. And it, this air and air model is often applied in judicial assistance because various media analyzes show that the effectiveness of assistance is greatest when this model is used. Um, 
heeft gezien. Um, the um, risk of reoffending is at first at the police, then it's the short list they have from the lay, and uh, they look at it first, and that's uh, we call it that the 2A. I don't know why they call it the 2, but it's the 2A, and uh, that's what the police is using. And then uh, when the, the youngster is uh, getting on to the other agencies, then the 2B in um, um, individual assessment is uh, filled in. And both of these lists are based on the Washington State Juvenile Court Assessment. Um, each partner continues to work with information collected and analyzed by a partner in the earlier chain. So, as you understand, the police gets this information, the second agency in the chain will get of, don't have to ask again that information, but goes further and further and further. And then um, uh, if it's necessary, but I will show you that on the next slide, if it's necessary, then they go um, even to a uh, psychological of psychiatric, psychiatric research. So you see it here again, they start at the police, then they go to the um, the uh, child care and protection board and um, and if it's possible from the police that they say well it's a first offender it's a minor offense etc cetera, etc cetera, then they can go to halt and if halt is con is uh, continuing their approach um, th then they um, uh, can end here their uh, the the then that is the the last step for the youngster uh, and going into a diversion project. And also it's possible, of course, a restorative justice project. Um, if we go from the um, probation, uh, child care and protection board, then there is going to the, um, come, there comes a more, uh, how do you say it, a broader research about the juvenile and their and his or her parents. Uh, about the whole family life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I will uh, the domains I will describe later on. But if the um, child protection agency says already from well, you know, I think there is so much more um, with this child, then they go to a uh, psychological um, uh, research, and that's our National Forensic uh, Institute. Um, sometimes it takes a long time, unfortunately, but uh, these days we try to, uh, to make the process a bit faster. And if, the, if they're not going for the psychological research, they go for um, then the, um, they go to probation and there will, uh, the next steps, etc., will be made. Then there will come an, 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 uh, in um, uh, and plan what shall we do and work plan and evaluation. Um, when it's all ended, then there comes for the because it's even it's a long list delay, I must say, and they have done a research not that long time ago, because they really want to shorten it, because it's sometimes so long that it's for the even for the workers, it takes too much time. But also the question is, um, isn't it that you can have the same amount of information with less questions? So that's what they're working on now uh, nowadays. And then, of course, at the end, they make a plan which pers perspective, um, what, what will be the intervention or a sentence or whatever. And that's all written in a child letter, as they call it in more uh, simply and clear language. Because if you see the lay and all the, 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 the assessment, it's not that easy to see it. And all the conclusions, et cetera, of course, um, are made and of course told uh, to, the, to the juvenile delinquent or juvenile offender and his or her parents, but still it can be um, difficult to understand. The child-friendly letter, sometimes it's also translated in another language, is all, of course, much, much easier for um, the juvenile delinquent and uh, his family. So what we uh, measure is the general risk, the dynamic risk, 
but also the care signals. Um, and then, of course, the appropriate behavioral intervention. That's more uh, what shall we do? Is there uh, what interventions can we um, uh, are applicable for this youngster? Um, and what I told you before, the outcomes are processed in a criminal advice or a plan of action. The plan of action, of course, is um, with the parents. Um, and if there is an, 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 uh, an social worker or what, they can explain that to the parents, but it's also made with in the multidisciplinary teams, the decision. Well, if you look at the lay, there are do the domains that are uh, family, of course, school, work, leisure time, <clears throat> relations, I say peers here because they're so important in this uh, in this phase. But relations is a much broader uh, um, aspect, of course, because it's also like uh, neighbors, aunts, uh, whatever, uh, school teachers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, alcohol and drugs use um, uh, is, of course, uh, one of those questions of one of the domains. Mental health. Uh, mental health, sometimes uh, juveniles are coming and um, have mental health problems, already have a psychiatric or a psychologist who are helping them. That's also, of course, very uh, important information. Um, and all alcohol and drugs, um, I must say, that's also, of course, a question uh, um, about the parents. All the domains are seen in that respect, of course. Um, attitude, attitude again, uh, and that's also attitude. What you see, uh, attitude against the police, or uh, attitude with their peers, or whatever. Um, aggression, and of course, skills. We all also uh, want to look. Uh, what are the possibilities, or perhaps what are the risk factors with the skills? Now, family life is, of course. Uh, one of the most important things and family life is also um, what you see in the child letter, the family is uh, getting also the child letter. Uh, that's of course. Um, and let me see now they are busy, but I told you before they are uh, trying to get uh, the, the same domains, but then with less amount of questions. That's what they uh, want to do. Um, uh, what, what you can see is that um, each partner collects information and, and, and that's the, the information you get from all the domains, you are analyzed that. And when it's analyzed, so first the police and then the protection board, et cetera, it's analyzed and you give it to, uh, by, to the next partner, partner in the chain. This prevents unnecessary, unnecessary repetition of information collection. That's the same like the other approach of the, the ACAP I talked about, because it's most um, irritating for uh, the, the juvenile and uh, his or her parents that they have always have to repeat and repeat all the information. Um, but this also means that there is a risk eh? because you give the information from the first uh, agency to the second, etc. But um, it's sometimes that there is in that respect blind copying information and you don't ask if there is an update because sometimes even if it's not that long time uh, between those two agencies, it still can be that um, circumstances have changed. Sometimes um, even a child has, uh, lives now in a new uh, family and, uh, and that's things that we, uh, all, all, we have to check, of course, some things. Um, okay, so first it is at the police, the, 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 the shortened screening instrument, that's the 2A, as I said, um, and then the, with that aim, establishing a risk profile and determining whether additional testing is necessary. As I said before, you can see that again in the, in the picture, if is additional, additional testing uh, necessary or not. If these, there are concerns or problems in several domains, 
and if you can see that, then of course, then the um, two two B is then um, taken of the child of the youngster. Sorry, the set of tools includes guidelines and checklists for interviews, questionnaires for questionnaires for child suspects and parents, score forms because you score on the several domains. Um, and the score forms scientifically based weighing and calculating models and guidelines and formats for reporting. So it's all like in an, uh, in formats, which on one hand makes it easy. On the other hand, it's a lot of formats. So it's really, you have to um, uh, be specialized to work with delay. Um, the filling in and scoring items Calculating the outcomes and creating reports is done with the help of a computer application. That makes it a bit easier. All partners in juvenile justice certain with, with work with delay. So delay is really for all the, um, now as you can see, all the agencies who are uh, involved are working with this individual assessment instrument delay. Um, the goal is that the lay evolves more to an individual assessment that also measures more is more focused, I would say, on what kind of support care needs the youngster and his or family, because it does already, of course, in a way, but if you look at the lay, it's really more an um, a risk assessment, the recidivism risk, um, then it uh, should look also more to, uh, in my respect, to the care of what does this child need, of this youngster need. And I think that um, in the focus project Stephanie and I have worked with, that um, that, that is uh, really what they want, that we see more uh, at those domains we measure in the lay, but you also take these domains much more to see what is the care this youngster and family needs. Um, but we are not there yet, I think. Um, I thought it perhaps nice um, to show you also what we have in the Netherlands, but funny enough, we don't work a lot with, uh, with it already, but there is an app and this app is made on our ministry made it and it's um, it's called a an, uh, life visor and um, it, it's, um, an, it's lifestyle guide. I don't know if that's the appropriate um, way to call it, but it's an app and this app um, it's with the, the domains I just told you, it's, I think they are the same, yes. This family, housing, uh, work, leisure, relationship, alcohol, drugs or gambling addiction, mental health, behavior, attitude, aggression problems and skills. Um, and what you see is that they, uh, those apps, it can be filled in by the youngster itself, him or herself. Uh, the family, and the app can be also filled in with the uh, social worker or another professional who works with the juvenile. And the, the, the way is that we think that's much easier sometimes um, uh, for, especially for the youngster, to fill it in in an app than um, uh, than have all those forms, forms, forms done by the uh, social worker. So I think it's, um, uh, it, it's uh, especially for youngsters, I think this is a really, real good. Um, but unfortunately, it's not really worked with uh, already to, with many agencies. But I think um, the planning is that it will be also used for the lay soon. But this, as you can see, the same domains uh, that with, are with the lay. Okay, then I'll come to the end of my um, uh, power, my uh, presentation, and I, I come again uh, end with participation because I really think think that it's so so important that um, the the youngster 
will participate in uh, his own welfare. Uh, participation is both an end in itself as well a means the end of achieving all the other rights enshrined in the convention. So participation always comes back to the best interest of the child is that you let the child participate in his own welfare, the decisions about of his own welfare. Really participation makes the youngsters feel that they're heard and taken seriously. And I think every human being finds it very important to be heard and taken seriously. Um, and third, they probably will accept better sanction and a bigger chance of cooperation. I think that it's, you know, it's, uh, um, I think it's already, I think Stephanie made an, an uh, research about it, that if you participate, if you let the youngsters participate, that the motivation, the motivation to uh, work further with the social worker, or even if you go to uh, to a juvenile detention center, they accept better and they are more motivated to work on the goals, in what comes in the her or his perspective plan. So I think it's um, more important. Um, so I want to stress it again, participation. Thank you. I will look at the Q&A. Stop. I will stop. Thank sharing. you. Yeah, we have questions. And the first is, does the individual assessment affect reduce adolescent recidivism in the Netherlands? Yeah. Are there any statistics on this? Do they not commit a crime after serving their sentence? Well, uh, you see the last two years in the Netherlands, the juvenile delinquents figures are a bit lower, but um, I can't uh, make a connection in any respect to the individual, to the lay, because, um, but perhaps Stephanie knows better, but I don't think that there has been a research to make the combination with the lay and the figures of a juvenile delinquency. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Marta also, I guess, uh, has a question. Please, Marta, you are unmuted. You can ask. I don't hear you, Marta. Yeah, we don't hear you. You have to, yeah. No. No, you did it. You, you have to uh, unmute yourself. Yes. 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 Okay. Very good. Hi, Mark. Hi, June. I'm uh, in the other I part of the world. May I just introduce Marta because she has just okay. joined us. Uh, okay, uh, Marta. Uh, okay, from the very beginning, we have two participants here: the former and the present uh, president of the International Association of Youth and Family Judges and Magistrates. This association uh, is our uh, AHL child project uh, project um, associate partner. So Avril is from the UK, and Marta Pasquale is joining us from Argentina. Uh, so. Uh, thank you, Marta, by the way, for <laughs> joining us at five o'clock in the morning, your time. Okay, now I give the floor for you. Okay, June, uh, I want to ask, I live as, as Sholanta introduced me in the other part of the world. And we are having a very serious crisis uh, because of the COVID. Now we are in a very close, uh, close, uh, um, time, so uh, we are all locked, and we have many problems with the uh, kids that are locked. But I want to ask you a very practical question. You mentioned several times the interview with the interdisciplinary team. Are these uh, interviews or these uh, meetings with the family, with the extended family, in the offices? or in the neighborhood or where the kids live. Because what I've seen is when they came to the office, sometimes they have a version or they speak about how the kid is dealing and so on. But when you go to where the kids live or to the neighborhood or, or to that, 
I say that these are the eyes as we have to take a decision. Can you explain how you work with this? Yes, well, the police, um, if I understand your question, the police, um, it's not these, it's just at the, um, uh, at, the, at the office, let's say, but the, um, what uh, the, um, uh, the Child Care Protection Board, um, the, they ask the child and parents to come to the office, but sometimes they know that it will be a problem, they'll go to the house. And sometimes what they do is if it's like um, two conversations, so that's not if you look at the ACAP approach, then it's not. They always go, go to the safety house, but that's also because it's too time consuming and they make fast decisions. So that's different, but that's all, of course, more for the first offenders often. So that's perhaps a bit different if you look at the ACAP, but if you look at the uh, individual assessment of the lay, then what you see is that um, uh, the child protection board sometimes go to the families and what, the, uh, what I know about juvenile probation, they often try to go to the uh, families. And indeed, it really, really makes a difference if you can see the environment where they live uh, and the, the rest of the family, because if you ask the parents, you never see the other children. And sometimes it's amazing what you can see in the household. If you see that our younger brother sometimes is even, you know, uh, sick or has an, 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 an retardation or whatever, and that um, otherwise you wouldn't even know that. So Thank I agree, but I also think that we don't do it enough. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I have also just a few questions. The first is, um, what do you think? What are the most important factors that can mo motivate children to participate in the process? Because you talked about participation a lot and emphasized it. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think that participation only works if they get good information. Mm -hmm. um, and that sometimes is not the case. Um, like if the child arrives at the police, the, you, should, you, you should hope that he gets good information about that they only can be hold six hours and that we try not to uh, hold them too long, et cetera, et cetera. All those rights, the right of the lawyer. And that's not always done in a decent way. It should be, of course, because according to the rules and regulations, of course, it should have been done, but it's not always. Uh, because the better you do that, the better you get also that the youngster doesn't feel, the, the, the youngster will feel more uh, at ease and will work more together. But as at the police, I know that in the other, like in the safety house, they always try um, when they uh, meet most of the time, that's the whole family, uh, and they meet them, that they um, try to motivate the youngster uh, on participation. And the way sometimes to do it is to uh, let them know um, if they give their own opinion, it really makes a difference but that's and if sometimes you know it's not even uh, I know like years ago it was not even asked the youngster what is their opinion and I think in those years last 20 years we really made a different uh, um, approach a different attitude ourselves in it that we now much more ask youngsters what is your what is your opinion? What do you think of your own situation? What do you think is your solution? And I always have a feeling that that will help them because they know they be hurt. But if they have the feeling that it's only for a, a theater <laughs> and they are only asked the questions, but nobody is helping or or listening to them, mm -hmm. then of course it doesn't make any sense. And sometimes you can see that, like in juvenile detention center, they. Uh, Sometimes they just ask it, but with no interest. They don't even look at the child, of the, the youngster. Then you know this won't work. But if it's done in an other way and more uh, friendly, of course, is that, that's definitely. But in all the other uh, aspects, looking at the age, developmental age of the child, knowing uh, what is um, for his or her important, you only can know that if you ask it. 
And I think that makes the juvenile more hurt. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. an answer on your, at your question. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, and also we have one more question. Thank you for your great, great presentation. Is youth probation service assigned to conduct the individual assessment as well as to organize and supervise the implementation of educational measures? Okay, that's a good question. Yes, because youth probation in the Netherlands um, is organized that it's a part of the individual assessment, the lay. So there is, uh, they get first the information about of the, uh, the, 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 no, the agency in the chain who had already in the information, then youth probation gets it. Um, one of the last agency that get the information, they get new information. Often they go, youth probation does uh, go to school, uh, stuff like that, or, or telephone with the, the teacher or whatever. So they get more information. And then of course, if the, um, the advice is youth, youth probation, then it's not this, no, I think it's never, but most of the time it will not be the same youth probation officer but um, there will, they have all the information already and then we'll start uh, helping or um, yeah, helping the, the, the youngster. But that's a different juvenile probation officer, but from the same agency. I don't know if I explain it right. I also have a related question, uh, how these two parts, 2A two and 2B are harmonized. Uh, is it to uh, A is like primary uh, assessment and to be uh, deeper, uh, more deeper, more extensive? Uh, did I get right you? Yeah, yeah that you get that right because to yeah. A is like more short, short mm -hmm. um, uh, form of it. And then a uh, shortened screening instrument, I should say. And then if the um, is, if the aim is to establishing a more broader risk um, profile, then you go to 2B, and 2B is really, um, no, it's a lot of questions, let's put it that way. Um, mm -hmm. and, and again, they, are, they, will, uh, they try to um, reframe it to get less questions, but at the same nine domains they have already. But it's uh, the first one is only like giving an indication. Mm -hmm. Do I have to get further for the risk need assessment, or is this enough? And can we go to halt or whatever? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for one question from my side? Yes. Yes. Of course. Okay. Uh, it seems in a practical way, uh, June, it, it seems logical to have a shorter and longer version of the assessment uh, depending on the offense and uh, what expected outcomes of, uh, after, after the offense. But what I'm interested in is, uh, is this regulated somewhere in the law or in some uh, uh, national uh, document that different types of assessment will be conducted depending on the severity of crime or depending on expected uh, measure or sanction. So is it regulated dif dif uh, differences within the assessment? Well, it's a good question and uh, thank you, but uh, I don't know if I have an answer because um, it's not in the law, but perhaps Stephanie can help me out, but because there must be regulation, I guess, but um, I really don't know it myself. Um, yeah, I think the regulation more relates to the different steps in the legal procedure, so that uh, reports are needed, for example, for um, pretrial detention to be um, uh, to be released uh, so that the young person is released from that and that you need a uh, report uh, uh, in order to know yeah on what conditions it can be released um, and then um, yeah for the the, the whole uh, trial but also when the prosecutor um, can divert the young person to projects also a report is needed when for example they as far uh, they think that it will be more than i think uh, it's, it's a number of hours, 30 or 40 hours of community service. 
so it's more attached to the type of decision that's taken in the, in the procedure and the, and the outcome of it. Uh, but that they made it in two parts, I think that's not strictly uh, regulated in the law. It's more, I think, because in the earlier phases, you have to make a sort of a quick assessment of the young person and, and well, yeah, what steps can be taken. And then in the, the second part, it's more detailed and longer and you have more time also to do that then. Do you agree, Jen? <sighs> Yeah, no, I do agree, but I don't, I, I don't, I know it's not in the law, but there must be uh, regulations about it. When do you stop with 2A and is that enough? Uh, and when you are obliged to go further to 2B, to that, but I don't know about it myself. Yeah, and, and one other comment that I had about uh, effectiveness and whether about the outcomes. Uh, June referred to the R and R model and also the uh, principles for uh, on what works, like the uh, risks, needs, and responsivity. So it is based on on those principles. So th the idea is that therefore you're looking for interventions that should work, <laughs> but of course there's no yeah there's no research done on on what the yeah effectiveness is of the of the instrument uh, on or doing an assessment on whether a young person will reoffend with the uh yeah the assumption is that you work from principles that lead to yeah effectiveness in that regard does it give an answer to you uh, dr uh, yeah, yes yes thank you thank you and to uh, I have one more question. Is it possible to obtain safe accommodation options in the safety house or there are only other services available? Um, do you mean with your question that um, the child is in danger? Yeah, and yes, yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah. It, um, it depends. What we most of the time do is that there is a, a child or a whole family is endangered, and then we look for what is the uh, an alternative to well, perhaps you the child has to get out of the house, uh, away of the parents. Then we'll uh, of course we have institutions, but that's not our first goal. We always try. Well, not always, but most of the time we try, is there somewhere a family or friends in the network so that we can place the child there for several days or time that is necessary to do better research in this family to help them out. This, that's our first goal, but sometimes, unfortunately, it's going to be uh, that, that the child has to go to a uh, foster uh, family they don't know or an institution, which is of course not what you prefer to do with a child, especially not if they're very young, but sometimes that's the only possibility when you really think that the child is endangered. Mm. And sometimes we try, but there we have a, a, a psychiatr psychiatrist <laughs> in the Netherlands, Peter Oudshorn, and he always says, we, what we should try is to um, let the whole family live in a family house and uh, that we are helping them all together. But of course, you understand that's not a possibility in one day. That takes time and there are only a few places, unfortunately, for a um, solution like that. Okay, thank you. So do we have further questions? Maybe I have, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, yeah, we have. Thank you, June, for your uh, presentation. I have just one que question regarding the National Forensic Institute. You mentioned, yeah, okay. So that is the only institution in your country. That is the first question. And how does the actually assessment uh, in that institute uh, looks like? Who conducted, how, for how long, and so on? Well, the NIFP, that's the one who's doing the research um, in for especially for juvenile delinquency. And um, they, um, unfortunately, it's sometimes a long time because they don't have to, uh, that you have to wait, but they try, especially with the juveniles, of course, not to, um, to let that endure too long. Um, it's most of the time it's that uh, a psychologist 
um, talks and do examinations of the youngster and and if they are beneath 18 also with the parents the family and make a report of that um, and then send that to the court of course uh, with recommendations if that's also the question that's not always um, the NEFP does that sometimes it is that um, the but then it's not the judge but then the um, uh, the child care protection board asks sometimes of uh, other agencies a report but it's um, mostly done by the NIFP yeah okay and just maybe one more question uh, do you maybe also have some another type of let's say juvenile institutions who conduct assessments i mean where when a child comes there and lives there for like i don't know a month or something or that doesn't exist okay you mean that it's like an intern uh re i'm right now um what happens is that youngsters are you know when they go to juvenile detention center um in custody then it's still also there possible that there's going to be a research uh, a psychological research so that is a possibility yeah Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, June, very much.